Good morning. I'd like to call this um, meeting of the Energy Policy Committee to order. We don't have a quorum, but we don't need a quorum because we don't have a bill before us today. I uh, pulled my bill back from the agenda. We scheduled this hearing in response to a brief conversation that Representative Beard and I had on the House floor. When we were debating the Energy Omnibus Bill, Representative Beard offered an amendment uh, related to this litigation and the statute 216H, and it seemed that that wasn't the appropriate place and time to have a conversation about our respective views of the case and the decision, but that maybe we should convene the Energy Policy Committee. And um, so I put my bill out there to give Representative Beard a chance to propose his language again that he had proposed on the House floor. And since he didn't propose language, my language is more of a counterpoint to his. I decided, you know, I'm not really ready to push my bill at the time. I just want to create a forum for the discussion. So this morning what we're going to hear is from nonpartisan staff about the statute, and then we're going to hear from a law professor about the issues in the case and the decision and allow members to ask questions. So with that, uh, Mr. Eliff, if you could tell us about the statute in the lawsuit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you stated, our testifier will review Judge Nelson's decision um, on, on this case. What I wanted to do was, was to briefly place the statutes that Judge Nelson ruled on in the context of um, the larger body of energy legislation that was passed in 2007 um, in order to acquaint members who may not have been in the legislature at that time with the framework within which those statutes were enacted. 2007 was a very active time for energy legislation. The renewable energy standard was passed requiring uh, large utilities to uh, generate or procure 25 percent of their uh, retail electricity by 2025 from renewable resources. In the conservation area, uh, that was the year that the 1.5 percent energy goal was established that utilities are required to meet each year. 2007 also saw the uh, creation of the Next Gen Energy Board to research, report, and recommend to the legislature how the state can invest its resources to achieve energy independence, um, agriculture, and natural resource sustainability, and rural economic vitality. And the, the board also had its own 25 by 25 goal, whereby the agriculture, forestry, and working land in Minnesota would provide 25 percent of the energy consumed in Minnesota from renewable resources. And uh, 25 percent was very popular that year. There's also a state cellulosic biofuel goal that 25 percent of the ethanol use in 2015 uh, would be from uh, cellulosic uh, sources. Uh, and then there was Chapter 216H, which addressed um, greenhouse gas emissions. And that had a lot more in it than just the sections of the law that uh, Judge Nelson focused on. Uh, first, it established statewide reduction goals for uh, greenhouse gases. Taking 2005 as the base year, uh, goals were established to um, reduce those by 15 percent by the year 2015, by 30 percent in 2025, and by 80 percent in the year 2050. The chapter also um, gave a great deal of responsibility to the Commissioner of the Department of Commerce to develop a climate change action plan and have that completed and sent to the le legislature uh, the next year. Um, this was, I would say, a massive undertaking. Um, the plan was supposed to include uh, emission projections for future years, uh, a list of emission reduction options, and the costs and benefits of those options and the feasibility of implementing those options. Um, it was to re recommend options that would actually be implemented and was also to analyze the cap and trade system both in the context of Minnesota establishing such, establishing such a system on its own or in conjunction with other states. There were 55 members of an advisory group for this report from all sectors of Minnesota's economy. Uh, they established six technical working groups, one on residential energy use, one commercial and industrial, energy supply, transportation and land use, agriculture, forestry and waste, one on cross-cutting issues and one on cap and trade. The report ended up making 59 policy recommendations, calculating how many million metric tons of greenhouse gases could be uh, saved, uh, the cost per ton of each of those recommendations, and the level of support within those uh, subcommittees, uh, whether it was unanimous majority and the number of objections that, that obtained. Um, the report was sent to the legislature in 2008. The commissioner also was 
given the responsibility to develop and implement a regional approach to dealing with greenhouse gas emissions um, in 2007, uh, to talk to other states about ca cap and trade um, solutions and other types of solutions as well. And finally, the commissioner was charged with developing and designing a greenhouse gas emissions reporting system, uh, something that has been done. And then there's section 216H.03, which is the one of interest today. Uh, the head note calls it failure to adopt a greenhouse gas control plan. And it's subdivision three, I think, that the judge focused on, which said that after August 1st, 2009, no person shall do one, any of three things. One, construct in Minnesota a new large energy facility that would contribute to state public sector carbon dioxide emissions. Would not import or commit to import from power from a large energy facility that would contribute to those statewide emissions or enter into a long-term power purchase agreement that would contribute to those emissions. Uh, large energy facilities were, um, um, were those which, which are 50 megawatts or greater that were not in operation as of January 1st in 2007. And uh, natural gas facilities that provided peaking or intermediate or emergency backup services were, were excluded. <laughs> Those are the prohibitions, but the bill also contained several actions that could be taken to avoid the prohibitions. At the time, they were called off-ramps, and I want to discuss those because um, the, the, pro the prohibitions were not automatic. Uh, the first thing the bill did uh, was ensure that uh, prohibitions did not apply to projects, um, to mix me energy metaphors, that were in the pipeline at the time. So the uh, SR steel plant on the Iron Range was exempted, the Masabi Nugget, um, Iron Nugget Production Facility in Hoyt Lakes was exempted. Um, I believe the Spiritwood plant in South Dakota was exempted, and another plant that had um, that was out of state that had begun um, construction before the act was enacted was also exempted. So these prohibitions didn't apply to any of those uh, existing or in the pipeline plants. There was also action that could be taken by the state to avoid the uh, prohibitions being implemented. Um, most notably, the legislation said that the prohibitions were only to be in force until a comprehensive and enforceable state law or rule pertaining to greenhouse gases that directly limits and substantially reduces over time statewide power sector carbon dioxide emissions is enacted and in effect. So if the state were to produce such a plan, these prohibitions would not uh, need to be implemented. Um, individual project proposers could also undertake actions to avoid the prohibitions uh, by offsetting the emissions that would result from their projects, either by purchasing allowances from states that had a uh, cap and trade system or by reducing any existing facilities contribution to statewide um, carbon dioxide emissions. And then there were off-ramps that I guess I would call policy-related off-ramps off -ramps that uh, gave the PUC the authority to uh, determine um, some things. The new large energy facility or a PPA between a Minnesota utility and an outstate facility um, did not have to be prohibited if the PUC determined that that power was essential, is essential to ensure the long-term reliability of Minnesota's electric system. So the legislation did not put that reliability at risk. Um, the prohibitions also did not go into effect if the commission found that uh, the uh, project was necessary to allow electric service for increased industrial demand. So similarly, the state did not want to prevent economic development from occurring and wanted to be able to uh, address, uh, to allow those needs to be met, those energy needs to be met. And thirdly, um, the commission uh, could prohibit the, um, the prohibitions from coming into effect uh, to avoid placing a substantial financial burden on Minnesota ratepayers. In any of those three cases, if the commissioner, Commission made that determination, those prohibitions would not go into effect. So um, the prohibitions that we're speaking today are not automatic. There were off-ramps, and I just want, kind of wanted to remind folks of the totality of what that section of the bill, sec that act um, did. Thank you. Um, questions? Do we have any questions from members on the statute? Representative Beard. Madam Chair, just as I'm remembering, uh, when that came together, the original bill had none of that in it. 
as I recall, and I remember some of my colleagues marching down to Governor Pawlenty's office and saying, hold the phone here. This is, this is going to cripple us if you go ahead with this. I remember he was trying to outgreen the Greens, and I warned him that, uh, and others that you cannot do that. They're going to see your inch and raise you a mile, uh, which is where he went with his 2020 plan, uh, which I accused him of creating energy policy by bumper sticker slogan because, like Representative Mr. Eloff said, everything seemed to come up in 20s or 25s. It, it was nice square numbers that fit on a on a bumper sticker, I guess. Uh, but uh, these um, exemptions that Mr. Eloff referred to, actually, there was uh, Spiritwood is in North Dakota. Uh, there was a plant in South Dakota, the rebuild of the Big Stone plant which was actually um, uh, collapsed after we loaded up carbon costs and everything else on it and the transmission uh, difficulties and so on and so forth. And, of course, about that time, which was about the height of the uh, orchestrated effort to gin up public outcry over global warming, about 2007, the next year the economy tanked with the burst of the housing bubble and uh, things like that. So all this became a moot point for the last uh, seven, eight years as uh, electric demand collapsed um, pretty much from uh, the shutdown of second and third shifts and things that happened uh, across the spectrum. But uh, I just wanted to thank Mr. Ela for the overview of what happened, but uh, let the members know, and I can tell you uh, the rest of the time, we, I'm sure Representative Hortman and I can tell you, or Chair Hortman, I can tell you some of the backstory about the negotiating that went on to exempt, I think, an ethanol plant that was proposed to be coal-powered. Uh, the Excelsior Energy Project, which I got caught up in my freshman year here and trying to do a demonstration project to turn coal into gas and capture everything that comes out of it, like the mercury and the carbon dioxide and stuff that, that never happened and probably never will now. Um, that was in there. Uh, the off-ramps were comfort language that were given to several of us that uh, if things did get sideways, at least we weren't going to totally tank our economy. Um, I hear now that these off-ramps have become pretty much invisible and difficult to find. Uh, there was an assumption, and this is a new paragraph, there was an assumption there would be the Midwest Governor's Greenhouse Gas Trading Scheme of some sorts, and it was built around, I think, the hope that Chicago's Board of Trade would continue to trade in credit carbon, and that collapsed uh, four or five years ago, I think, because carbon credits uh, went down to many cents a a share and eventually the board said you know what this isn't working and we just stopped trading they stopped trading in uh, carbon credits at all uh, so the market sort of evaporated um, uh, that yeah there was so much to it was a fascinating time to deal in the in the public pressure the political pressure and not to mention the millions of dollars that flowed into this state through special interest groups to put pressure on us to make sure we got the maximum restrictions on coal-fired electricity in particular uh, we were, it seemed like we were the crucible, but it turns out that there were several states around the Union that were having the same fight at the same time, ginned up by the same interest groups that had the same mission in mind, which is what we call now the war on coal. Um, we could talk more about that perhaps if you want to, the strategy and what's going on behind the scenes and uh, uh, so on. But uh, anyhow, the, um, the thing I think that uh, was most annoying was how we treated our neighbors. Uh, we, exempt, we offered them an exemption and then made them come back here and fight for it all over again. Uh, the folks who own the Spiritwood plant, and I think there's three or four owners, if I'm not mistaken, had to actually hire some high-powered lobbyists to uh, have an exemption in a bill that, that uh, Senator Rosen and I carried uh, to clearly spell out that, you know, although we said it in 2007, we're saying it again, Spiritwood can go ahead and come online uh, without having to jump through all these hoops with carbon credits or offsets or what have you. Uh, so yeah, it was a complicated bill and an amazing and trying time, and we're still living with the uh, consequences today, and I have a hunch it's not over yet, Madam Chair. But thank you, probably maybe a few comments about that. Thank you, Representative Beard. And although, you know, my thoughts are just one legislator's uh, thoughts, there are just only three things I would I would disagree with you about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Big Stone 2 um, didn't come into being for economic reasons and not regulatory environment, but I'm sure we could have a long and spirited conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that the, whether the utility of building spirit wood was debated by the clients of the customers of GRE and whether that was a good idea or a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And it's currently, as my understanding, is mothballed, so ultimately wasn't needed. Um, 
But I would also disagree with your characterization that there were interest groups ginning up interest in this issue. I think after Americans saw what happened with Hurricane Katrina, which was a very intense storm, there was a, just a fevered pitch of pressure from the public for us to do something. Mm -hmm. um, and that all across the country, there were uh, members of the public pushing legislatures. Now, of course, when members of the public start getting agitated about an issue, it does create an environment where interest groups can push in certain directions. But I think you might see a vast left-wing conspiracy on the same topic where I would see a vast right-wing conspiracy. There's definitely big money battling on both sides, but I think the American public is interested in having its um, public policy makers look seriously at issues and to make a difference when we can to prevent harms where we can and prevent expenses where we can. But otherwise, I pretty much agree with all the comments Certainly. you made. Representative Beard. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I wasn't prepared. I was actually prepared to hear about the court case and what was going on, but uh, we should have a, just a, a few little um, fun discussion items here this morning, I guess. And one of them is Hurricane Katrina. Uh, the timing on that was an absolute uh, windfall for people who were looking to use a natural disaster to uh, sound the alarm. Um, a her Category 5, I believe it was, the only one to hit since 1930s, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And it hit a, seven, a city that's built what, 8 feet, 10 feet below sea level. <laughs> that it hadn't happened before was actually the miracle, not that it actually finally happened. But that happened at a time when uh, pretty broad pronouncements were being made by a former vice president that we were going to see uh, these incredible uh, uh, expensive hurricanes that were going to hit with amazing consistency. We were coming in for a a real Armageddon of natural disasters and actually just the opposite has happened uh, since Katrina I think we've had two more brushes with minor hurricanes and we've actually been in the slowest hurricane season worldwide uh, since that time uh, I could go on with a whole list of things I have in another notepad about predictions that have been made and that haven't come to pass but you're right Hurricane Katrina happened at an opportune moment for uh, people to um, uh, seize the day for a, a public relations coup or nightmare, whichever side you're on. And I think we're probably on opposite sides of that uh, idea of what it was a coup or a nightmare. Representative Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate uh, my friend Representative Beard's comments. Um, I, I, I would uh, I would suggest that perhaps uh, the opportune time window continues to uh, if you would characterize it that way, continues to increase because we know that if you are under 28 years old uh, living on this planet, you have not lived during a month when the average temperatures, uh, when the temperature has been below average, uh, the worldly monthly temperatures. Um, that's uh, the large window of opportunity uh, to use Representative Beard's characterization. Um, the world is uh, getting warmer. Uh, the average temperature continues to be exceed on a monthly basis. We've had 12 of the warmest years in the last 15 years in the history of the Earth, and uh, I think you're right. The public is rightly saying we need to do something about this, Madam Chair. And members, maybe our next committee will watch An Inconvenient Truth and then debate the <laughs> finer points of science <laughs> therein. Uh, we'll take Representative Scott probably on this point, and then we'll maybe have the law professor come up and talk about the case. Representative uh, Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering, Representative Morgan, you said since the beginning of the earth, uh, who was keeping records back there when it all started? Just wondering. Representative Morgan. Uh, Madam Chair, the earth was keeping records. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no more questions for uh, Mr. Eliff on the statute. Uh, then we'll bring down our law professor who's graciously agreed to share his time with us this morning. Uh, Mamet Koner Steenberg is the associate dean for faculty and he's the Briggs & Morgan Excel Energy Chair in Energy and Environmental Law. He also serves on the board of um, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. So I figured his two um, different affiliations there canceled each other out, and he has agreed to be an unbiased interpreter of the law for us to the extent someone can do that. Uh, welcome, and please state your name for the record, and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Matt Conar steenberg uh, yes, I, I uh, will do my best to steer clear of uh, conspiracies on the left or the right um, and, and do my best to try to explain, uh, as I read it, what happened in this, in this particular case. I just want to make it clear that the, the opinions I share today are entirely mine, uh, should not be attributed to Excel or Briggs or the MCEA or anybody else, or William Mitchell for that matter. So uh, from my perspective, Madam Chair, 
the judge in this case made three important decisions. And I'd just like to list those off before I, with your permission, get into a, a deeper discussion of those. First of all, uh, this, this case was heard in federal court. And so the judge made an important decision about whether or not she had jurisdiction over the case. And that was an issue that was debated by the parties. And I'd like to come back to that in a moment and talk a little bit about the arguments on both sides of the, the jurisdictional question. Second, uh, having found that she did have jurisdiction over the case, uh, Judge Nelson uh, made a statutory interpretation choice. And she chose to read uh, the statute in a way uh, that, that it could thus be characterized that it potentially does apply to out-of-state transactions. And that leads us into the somewhat awkwardly titled Dormant Commerce Clause Doctrine. I'd like to talk about that a little bit as well. And then the final decision uh, that I think is important to note here uh, is that Judge Nelson did not rule on any of the other uh, potential challenges to the statute. Uh, Judge Nelson chose to confine her opinion purely to the question under the Dormant Commerce Clause Doctrine involving this question of extraterritoriality. So it did not address some of the other challenges that are still potentially hanging out there. So with your permission, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to begin with the, the question of jurisdiction. Uh, this, is a, this is a constitutional issue. Uh, federal courts cannot exercise their jurisdiction under, under Article Three of our Constitution without there being a case or controversy. And what that really means is that the federal courts want to be sure that the litigants before them, the parties before them, have enough of a stake in the game, have enough uh, of an adversity to each other that it warrants the federal court, if you will, spilling its ink uh, on, 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 the, uh, on the issue that's been raised. Uh, sometimes this issue is characterized uh, under the doctrine that we know is standing, and the question there is whether the, the party bringing the lawsuit can demonstrate an injury in fact. Um, in this particular case, arguments on both sides, uh, the plaintiff's arguments uh, essentially rest, the demonstration that there is a, an injury in fact here, essentially rest on some positions taken, as I understand it, by the Department of Commerce, suggesting that um, simply putting power into the, the grid that Minnesota shares with other states and, in fact, with, with provinces in Canada might be enough to trigger the statute even if the, uh, the, the power that's being bought and sold there is entirely between out-of-state uh, entities. So that was the, that was the basis of the, of the plaintiff saying we have, there should be a, a finding of jurisdiction here. Our injury is that as we, as we look at the positions taken by the Department of Commerce, it seems to be uh, that there's a, a concern that the statute might be applied to those purely out-of-state kinds of transactions. The, the response to that from the, from the defendants uh, was twofold. Uh, first of all, um, that issue had never been fully determined, if you will. Uh, while, the, while the Department of Commerce had stated in a, in a couple of uh, matters pending before the uh, PUC, for the Public Utilities Commission, uh, had suggested this, this sort of line of reasoning, uh, the PUC never actually reached a point where it either adopted or rejected that, that particular interpretation of, of the statute. Um, the other argument that the defendants made here is that is really something that they, they make in their briefing. They, they clarify, the defendants clarified in the briefing that this statute really was intended to apply to in-state transactions between uh, in-state utilities selling to in-state customers. So that's, that's a clarification the defendants make in their briefing to the judge. So the judge is confronted with these arguments, and in this particular instance, the judge decides, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, let me finish the, the previous thought, to just to continue the defendant's argument. So the defendant's argument is, um, from their perspective, given that this law does not apply in an extraterritorial way, given, that it, given from their perspective as they interpret it, it only applies in state, um, there is no injury. There is no injury to those, those out-of-state uh, kinds of interests. That's, that's the, the response. The judge uh, sided with the plaintiffs in this case, found that the, the case, uh, found that the plaintiffs had standing and that the case was ripe for adjudication, uh, pointing to the reluctance of some of the firms involved uh, to buy uh, from coal-fired generators because they were concerned about the position that the Department of Commerce had taken. Um, and uh, the judge rejected, uh, essentially, the, the clarification that, that the state made in its, in, its, uh, in its briefing about the scope of the, of the statute, 
um, characterizing that as, in essence, a voluntary cessation, saying that this, for all we know, the state will take this position in, in its briefing and then change its mind later about what the statute means. Um, another aspect to this, uh, beyond sort of the, the constitutional question of whether there's jurisdiction, is the question of whether the federal court should exercise jurisdiction. Federal courts have a lot of leeway even when the Constitution gives them jurisdiction over matter. They have a lot of leeway for various reasons to say, in this particular instance, we're going to abstain from exercising that jurisdiction. And one of the circumstances where that arises is where there is an unsettled issue of state law, and the resolution of that issue of state law might dispose of the controversy. So we call that the abstention doctrine. And in this particular case, uh, Judge Nelson determined that abstention was not appropriate she determined that there was not an unsettled issue of state law. She found that the statute on its face uh, was clear in its language and that there was no uh, sort of room for interpretive confusion there. So all of that is, I'm a law professor after all, a fairly long-winded way of saying uh, that the judge determined in this case that the plaintiffs had enough of an injury uh, to give them standing in this case and that there was no other prudential reason for the, for the federal court to, to abstain from, from handling the case. So with that in mind, then the judge moves to uh, the merits. And the merits in this particular hearing involved, as I said, this awkwardly named constitutional law doctrine called the Dormant Commerce Clause Doctrine. Um, the Dormant Commerce Clause Doctrine is derived from uh, Article I of the Constitution, uh, the Commerce Clause in, in Article I. The Commerce Clause is that part of the Constitution that says Congress has the authority to regulate interstate commerce. And that was actually uh, an important feature, if you will, of our Constitution and a change from what I might characterize as our first Constitution, the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation didn't give Congress that authority. And what happened as a result was that states began competing with each other. States started putting up trade barriers, embargoes, tariffs that made it very difficult for <clears throat> commerce to flow across borders and resulted, frankly, in political rivalries between the states. And that's one of the reasons that the Articles of Confederation broke down. Um, Justice Willie Rutledge of the United States Supreme Court says that, in fact, this issue of interstate commercial rivalry he calls it the proximate cause of our national existence. He says that the reason we had Philadelphia and the reason we have the Constitution we have now is because of this interstate rivalry issue. So the Commerce Clause is, is fairly important to uh, constitutional law nerds like myself. Um, we, we take this very seriously. And what it says is that Congress has the authority to regulate interstate commerce. The dormant Commerce Clause doctrine is a judge-made doctrine that you won't find in the text of the Constitution. But it goes something like this. If Congress affirmatively has the power to regulate interstate commerce, then by implication, states must lack some of that authority. States should stay out of the way of interstate commerce to some degree. And the history of this doctrine has been one of trying to determine to what degree. What kinds of state conduct is it that runs afoul of of sort of invading the province of Congress to regulate interstate commerce. So we're really talking about situations where Congress has not acted, has not adopted a law, uh, has not used its Commerce Clause power, yet nevertheless courts will step in and say, states, you need to back off and stay out of the way because this belongs to Congress. So that in a sort of conceptual nutshell is the dormant Commerce Clause doctrine. Uh, in, its, in its use in the courts, it really comes out in three forms. The first involves discrimination against interstate commerce. And the classic example here is, is one I already mentioned, protectionist laws. When one state sets up a, a set of laws meant to protect a local industry against competition from, from outside the state. We call that discrimination against interstate commerce. And those kinds of laws are routinely struck down. It's very unusual for a discriminatory protectionist law to be upheld. The second uh, manner in which the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine is deployed by the courts, if you will, is in the situation where the law is not discriminatory. So the law is even-handed, applies to in-state and out-of-state firms with, with equal force, and yet there is a sense that the impact or burden on interstate commerce is just too much. So this becomes a balancing test. 
uh, when a claim is brought under this part of the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine, the judge has a balancing test job. The judge says, in this hand, I have the, the, the supposed local benefit of the law. Maybe it's public health, maybe it's the environment, maybe it's public safety. On the other hand, I have the burden of the law on interstate commerce. And the judge is in the, in the position of having to weigh those things and determine whether the law uh, ought to be upheld given the burden on interstate commerce. It's interesting that, that given the situation of the, of the judge in, in that balancing test, this, this particular part of the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine has been routinely critiqued by a lot of folks, including uh, Justices Scalia and Justice Thomas, who say it's inappropriate for a judge, especially a federal judge, to be making that kind of policy determination that should rest with legislators. So goes, so goes the argument of Justices Scalia and Thomas. So those are, those are two aspects of the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine. The third is something that is obviously at issue in this case, and it's the notion of, of extraterritoriality. The basic idea here is that states should not be able to regulate uh, transactions that are wholly outside of their borders. And it's a, it's a notion that is drawn from federalism. Uh, we live in a, in a federal system where states ought to respect each other, a comedy. It's also a... Um, a notion that seeks to prevent economic balkanization. So that if, if we had a situation where each state was trying to regulate externally, we end up with a balkanized economic system. The examples in this area are a little bit harder to, to identify because it's rare that a state will overtly adopt a law that says we're now regulating transactions wholly outside the state. That, that's a fairly rare in, uh, occurrence, as you might imagine. The examples we do have uh, from the Supreme Court level involve cases involving, for example, price controls. And so, for example, uh, there was a Connecticut law which required beer companies to post prices each month, and they had to promise that the, the prices in Connecticut were not any higher than the prices in bordering <coughs> states. Okay, So the price for beer in Connecticut couldn't be any higher than the price for beer in the bordering states. And on the one hand, one might look at that and say, well, that's a, a consumer protection kind of measure. We're trying to protect uh, beer drinkers from, from, from being gouged uh, by the beer companies. Um, but that's not the way the court looked at it. The court said that is, in effect, trying to regulate outside of Connecticut. Because if you're, if you're a firm that wants to sell beer in Connecticut and you have a reason for wanting to charge more, perhaps the transportation costs or something else make it greater to sell in Connecticut, the only way you can charge more in Connecticut is by raising your prices in the neighboring states. Involving tra those are transactions that have nothing to do with Connecticut. They're, they're beer transactions totally outside the state. So the court looked at that and said, it looks to us like your law is having an extraterritorial effect. It looks like your price control law in Connecticut is putting these firms in the position of having to alter their behavior outside of the state. And that concerns us under the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine. Okay. With that in mind, the only one of those three aspects of the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine that the judge dealt with in this opinion is that last one, the extraterritoriality issue. She did not deal with claims of, of discrimination against interstate commerce, protectionism. Those are in this case, but she, she didn't address them. And she didn't claim, deal with the claim that even if the law is even-handed, the burden outweighs the, the benefit too much. She didn't deal with either of those in this opinion. All she dealt with was this question of extraterritoriality. So the arguments there. On, on the plaintiff's side, uh, I think, th as I understand it, the plaintiff's arguments really rest on a couple of points on this question of extraterritoriality. First of all, they point to the nature of the electric grid. And the, the metaphor or analogy that gets used here sometimes is it's, it's like a water reservoir. Electrons get poured in here. Electrons get taken out there. It's not as if one can draw a connection, a link between these being the exact electrons that were dumped into the reservoir being the same ones that are taken out. One can't do that exactly. So electrons flow where they want to flow in the grid according to the laws of physics, uh, just like water molecules flow where they want to flow in a reservoir. And one can never be sure that the water that's put in over here is the water that's taken out there, that the electricity electrons put in here are the ones taken out there. So why does that matter? From the plaintiff's perspective, it matters because as they read section uh, 216H03, it says no person shall do that list of things uh, that the gentleman referred to that increase Minnesota's statewide power section, uh, sector carbon emissions. No person shall. And as they read that, they say we don't see a limitation that says 
no person involved in a Minnesota-based transaction. It just says no person. So from their perspective, putting those two things together, um, hypothetically, you know, utilities making coal-based electricity in Wisconsin and selling to consumers in Iowa, from the plaintiff's perspective, it might be claimed that they're violating the Minnesota law because those coal-derived electrons, if you will, might flow to Minnesota customers. And from their perspective, the only way to avoid that happening, the only way to avoid running afoul of the statute is to either comply with Minnesota law, even with regard to wholly out-of-state uh, electricity transactions. Um, really, that's, that's the only way to, 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 from their perspective, to make sure that they don't run afoul of the law. Moreover, the plaintiffs argue, if other states adopted laws like this, we could have economic balkanization. That's, that's the other part of the argument. Therefore, the argument goes this law is uh, extraterritorial and ought to be invalidated. Okay. So the defendant's arguments, uh, a couple of those uh, to point out. First of all, the, the, the defendants point again to what they said in their briefs, that, that the statute should be interpreted as applying not to those wholly out-of-state transactions, that it should not be interpreted as being applied to that, if you will, Wisconsin to Iowa electricity transaction. It was only intended to be applied to uh, transactions involving in-state utilities providing electricity to in-state customers. Now, they might buy that electricity from out-of-state, but the idea is that the state is governing or rather regulating an in-state utility in its in-state uh, transaction with an in-state customer. That's what the state says in its briefing. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, the, 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 the state argument goes, there is no extraterritoriality here, um, that, that this is purely an in-state matter and that this does not have the kind of characteristic where it's reaching out and grabbing purely out-of-state kinds of transactions. <clears throat> so there's a threshold issue here that the judge has to decide, and that is how to interpret the statute. And the, the judge characterizes this as a choice between, if you will, two, in, two sort of canons of interpretation. The first is the plain meaning rule, that we're going to read a statute uh, that is unambiguous on its face. We're just going to take it at face value and read those plain words and apply them. And in fact, that is a canon of interpretation that you find uh, in Chapter 645 of the Minnesota Statutes, which instruct our state judges how to, in, how to interpret laws, or purport to instruct our state judges how to interpret laws. Um, so there's that, there's that notion on the one hand, a plain meaning reading. And in this case, a plain meaning reading would take that phrase, no person shall, and, and take it at face value as theoretically applying to folks in Minnesota, but also to transactions outside of the state. So that's one choice. The other, the other possibility is to read the statute more narrowly than that, and is, that is to adopt the interpretation that the state has provided in its briefing, that this is really intended to apply to in-state transactions. Now, why would the judge do that? Well, there is a, a canon of interpretation which says when a judge is confronted with potentially invalidating a state law under the Constitution, the judge should be reluctant to do that, especially a federal judge, because of issues of respect between the federal government and state governments. Federal judges should avoid, if possible, invalidating state laws under the Constitution. And one way to do that is to interpret the statute in a way that makes sure it doesn't run afoul of the Constitution. And that's the interpretation that the state attempts to provide in its, in its briefs, uh, arguing you know, that, that it should be interpreted as applying purely to in-state transactions and therefore no constitutional issue with extraterritoriality. So we have these competing canons of interpretation and the judge sides with the plaintiffs in this instance and says, I'm going to apply a plain reading. I'm not going to take the course of saying that, that uh, I, should, I should refrain from interpreting this, this statute in a way that will invalidate it. Instead, I'm going to read it at face value. And from the judge's perspective, face value leads her fairly quickly to the result that it's, it's an extraterritorial law. Very briefly, uh, Madam Chair, the, the, the final decision uh, that I've alluded to here that, that I think is important to keep track of is that uh, the judge only decided this question of extraterritoriality uh, on the merits, did not decide any of the remaining claims, which include a claim of discrimination against interstate commerce, a claim that the law unduly burdens interstate commerce, even if it is uh, not discriminatory, and then finally a claim that it's preempted by, by federal law. The judge did not decide those questions. Um, I don't know how fruitful it is to try to read the tea leaves about why she made that choice. 
on the one hand, it's a pretty standard practice for judges to limit their opinions to the, the narrowest sort of grounds necessary to decide a case. On the other hand, if, if she felt strongly that, that, that this, uh, this statute was, was infirm in other ways, presumably she could have made the choice to analyze it there as well. But it is, it is sort of a hazardous game to start speculating about what that might be about. So that's my assessment of the case, uh, Madam Chair, and I would be glad to try to respond to questions as best I can. Questions from members um, to the law professor. Uh, Representative Beard. Uh, first, just a comment while I'm trying to formulate a uh, question. Um, uh, I, I want to thank the testifier for his uh, uh, historical context regarding the original Articles of Confederation and our existing Constitution as it related to um, the balkanization of our economy. Uh, I think that's an important uh, principle for us to remember. Um, and I'll say uh, that just to make this observation as I'm um, withdrawing from this place next year. Uh, that one of the things that um, uh, troubles me is when, when we're having our debate about policies that affect the economy of Minnesota and uh, how we can make our state bigger, better, stronger, faster, whatever we think we're doing, um, oftentimes in debate a comment will slip out uh, that sounds um, mean-spirited. Um, we compare ourselves sometimes uh, to Mississippi or Nebraska or anybody else. Pick a, pick a name, pick a number. Um, uh, I, particularly, uh, the environmentalists are very fond of uh, complaining that we're sending so many billion dollars a year out of this state to foreign enterprises, foreign in this case meaning Wyoming or Louisiana, uh, to purchase um, power or energy or what have you. Madam Chair, the caution I leave for those that stay behind and continue this discussion is that this is the United States, and we actually actually collaborate and work with each other. Uh, like Grandpa used to say, and every economist will tell you, you sell what you're good at, you buy what you're not good at. And in the case of Minnesota, fuel for our energy conversion plants is something that we're not good at. Uh, other people are better, and so we send our money there, and that is not a bad thing. So I know the, uh, uh, I say all that just because uh, the gentleman referred to economic balkanization as being unconstitutional, and I would uh, concur with him that it's also a very bad idea. It's why we have a compact of the states and why we have the great American experiment. But while we're debating these issues here, let's be a little more respectful of what other states are good at and be okay buying that just as they're good at or they're okay with buying stuff we're good at, like making scotch tape and pacemakers and spam, for instance. I think we can be proud of that, and I think that uh, they should be good sending us their money just as we should be good sending them our money. Uh, so I just wanted to comment on the economic balkanization comments, and thank you for helping to lay that foundation as we consider this going forward. Professor, I think we're the only nerds who are interested in the Articles of Confederation as a predecessor to the Constitution as you are. Um, any questions from members? I, I appreciate very much as a former law student being brought back to my con law <laughs> class because I don't think I've thought much about the Dormant co Commerce Clause since I left law school. And I think as legislators, it's a good topic for us to understand better. <coughs> Representative Atkins. Well, Madam Chair, with all due respect, I think about it all the time. <laughs> oh. We hear the Commerce <coughs> Chair. That's appropriate. <laughs> it seemed like the right thing to say, yeah. especially when we got the professor. Um, my, my question actually is uh, speaking or thinking proactively from, from, our, from this junction forward. Uh, would it be better for us to make when we when we draft these things, uh, because I do believe, and I think everybody, I hope everybody in the room believes that we should have a choice about where we buy our, let's assume for the sake of discussion that it's water. Uh, if we don't want to buy water from a certain place, we shouldn't in Minnesota be forced to buy that water from a certain place. Uh, but uh, as we discuss these things, as we draft these things, would we be better off drafting them in such a way to spell that out more clearly? Uh, it would seem to me that the legislative history with respect to this, uh, had the federal judge simply looked at that, my recollection of most of the discussion from a, on, the, on the floor in both bodies uh, would have spelled out quite clearly that it was the latter um, that uh, the judge should have relied upon and, uh, and thought about it more narrowly. But do you have any thoughts or advice for us as we draft these things for in future times? Madam Chair, Representative, I'll give the... Uh, uh, perhaps not a wholly unanticipated response, which is that it depends. 
Um, that's what I'm trained to say in most circumstances. Uh, I, I think that as, as a general matter, it makes a lot of sense to be thinking about these about these questions in the, in the process of legislation. The Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine can be a, a bit of a, of a, of a sticky thicket, uh, sticky wicket rather, and a thicket at the same time. Um, but um, but but one of the one of the one of the difficulties here, I think, is that while the doctrine includes this aspect of avoiding economic balkanization, that is also in tension with another really important aspect of our of our system, which is that this is a federal system, and the notion that states are the laboratories of democracy. Uh, you've heard, heard that phrase before, and ought to be allowed to. Uh, to experiment with different kinds of policies and try to bring those to bear to solve the solutions that their people individually confront. So there's a real tension between some really sort of hallowed and time-honored principles here, and I, I don't pretend to suggest that there's, a, there's an easy answer to that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Well, members, I'm sure the professor would be willing to hang around and answer some questions offline, but we have a pretty busy day here at the legislature. I want to thank members for coming in on a Monday morning to listen to some uh, constitutional law, and um, thank you, professor, for helping us thank understand you, the issues in the case. With that, the meeting is adjourned.